Hey guys, Mike from the WCA with the week 5 update from the fall 2013 semester. You are looking at a king and pawn end game played by the legendary Bobby Fischer, who had the black pieces against uh, Bill Lombardi. Um, Bill Lombardi's one of the most underrated grandmasters in American history. Uh, Bill lives in Manhattan today, and I had the pleasure of taking some lessons with him, listening to some lectures. Uh, just an incredible chess player, a lot of knowledge. And um, for the local players who know him, uh, to watch him analyze chess positions is a real treat because he, he's one of these players that just seems to be able to find counterplay and plans um, in, in just any position. Uh, really learned a lot from him. Um, and obviously, um, Fisher playing the black pieces um, doesn't need any introduction or um, any, anything else to add to his uh, legendary status. Here, playing each other in this position, this, this king and pawn ending is lost for, um, for white, so black has a win here. But we're showing it to you because um, at the, let's say, the 12, 1400 level, somewhere in that range, these king and pawn endings... Um, are missed a lot in games, not from this position. I think um, this position would be winning at, at all the levels at the WCA, but what you're going to see in a moment is where this position came from. And a very important skill to have as a chess player is to be able to recognize winning endings or endings that are better for you that are hiding in middle game positions. So it, it's sort of like a sculptor who sees a piece of clay or, or, or an ice sculptor, you know, you just, you see a big block of ice and if you're not really artistic, all, you, all you'll see is the ice, but the artist actually sees a lot more. They, they kind of see in their mind a way to take away the ice or shape the clay and when they get done, they have something um, just incredible that they saw hiding inside uh, the, the material. Here in chess, it's very, very similar. So I'm just going to briefly show you this position, which we'll come back to in a moment, but the ending that I just showed you um, is hiding here. Um, in this, this is a middle, this is an end game. It's not really a middle game position, um, but it's it's the king and pawn ending is not so clear here. So uh, one of Fisher's great skills was to be able to um, transform one position to another. So if I take you back here for a moment, I'm going to show you the conclusion of the game. Um, the way to win this position, it's not terribly hard. Um, the problem for white here is this pawn that I'm circling, this outside pass pawn, it's going to have to be stopped someday, either blockaded or captured. And when that happens, the king here on uh, c4 will just take this pawn. And this king is going to be on this square or this square uh, when it takes this pawn. If that's the case, then you'll see there's no way for the white king to trail the black king and stop him from taking these pawns. And once he takes these pawns, this is going to be way too fast to stop, and uh, you'll have an easy win. So it's because the pawn is so far outside that creates the problem for white. And it's funny, um, try to remember this. In the end game, your outside pawns can be worth a whole lot. In the opening, the wing pawns, the, the A and the H pawns, tend to not have as much value. I mean, they're useful for kicking away bishops that are pinning you and making escape squares for the king, but they, they don't often have as much say in the middle game as the other pawns do. Uh, your two center pawns are, are valuable at all stages of the game, but I, I'd like you to keep in mind how uh, important it is to have these pawns at the end of the game, especially if there are just kings on the board, because the king is is a relatively slow piece. It's powerful. Uh, you can see this king here on b2. It is controlling eight different squares. Um, the problem is it's not able to get from one side of the board to the other very uh, quickly. So if it has to stop an outside pass pawn, when it finally does, um, it, it, it very often is out of play, as it is in this game. Okay, so the conclusion to this game, um, Fisher just played a4, and uh, white is in real trouble. He could try to go to c2 and uh, protect his pawn again, but then Fisher's just going to keep pushing, and at some point, just get this pawn. And if you come after the black pawn, he just goes after yours, and there's no way to... Uh, to hold this position. White's going to lose everything here. Um, so that's why back in this position after a4, um, 
Lombardi just decided to go straight away for the uh, for the black pawn. So Fisher took on c3. White takes on a4. And you should be able to follow all of this um, without a chessboard. Although I would recommend um, that you set up the original position uh, when you see it in a moment on your board. So here, um, white resigned. As you can see, there's no way to stop uh, black from taking that pawn on f3. Okay, now let's go back to the position I showed you before, which is here. Um, white's 30th move in the game was rook e1, right here. This was white's last move. And let's start with a little set position analysis. And remember, the first thing we always do is count material. And you'll see that Fisher is up an exchange. And we've mentioned that simply means having a rook for a minor piece. So he's up an exchange. There's a rook here and a rook here, but black has the advantage of rook over bishop here. White has one extra pawn. You'll see they have six pawns and black only five. Um, so in terms of material, black is up a point. There are some other um, considerations, obviously, uh, besides the material. But a good rule of thumb is do material first. It's simple. If you're in a classroom, uh, any of the coaches that are listening, we, we always remind them to do material. Um, even, even in slightly advanced classes, just do the material because what happens there is you, um, you very often get someone who might not be so active in conversation to raise their hand. And um, as teachers, we always feel it's important that students hear their own voice in a classroom setting and you, it, it kind of connects them to the process. If you stay quiet the whole time in a lecture, and I, I think this goes for adults as well, um, you tend not to get as much out of it. But once your own voice is included, you're kind of vested into what's going on and um, you get more out of it. So anyway, after the material, um, you're, oh, and one other thing here, when you count material, um, this, is, this is good for the coaches who have uh, tournament players as students as well. You force yourself to look at the entire board. So counting material is such a simple process. You're just adding up points, but your eyes literally have to travel over the entire board to do that. It's a good way to kind of take in um, what's going on. Okay, so after that, we get involved with uh, things like king safety. And in the end game, it is very rare that a king will get mated, uh, although it is possible. You can walk your king into a box. Like you can see the white king is kind of boxed in here a little bit, but there are squares on the outside behind him to get away. So um, in terms of a mating attack, it's not going to happen here. So king safety, as you get to these end game positions, begins to get replaced with king activity. Um, the, the king's safety is really not an issue unless somebody queens. So here, maybe both kings can be considered equal in terms of uh, what they're doing. It's obvious that both of these players have activated the kings, right? Okay, um, what's next? Well, the bishop, in terms of peace activity in general, the two white rooks are on open files. So if we asked uh, students in the class how many open files are there in this position, the answer would be two. Um, this file here, the A file, is only half open, and it's half open for white. And what that means is when they say half open, it means the team that does not have a pawn on it because they're most likely going to be able to utilize or use the squares that their pawn left behind. So this pawn here on b4 was an a pawn earlier in the game and now it's on b4 so that opens up space for the white rook but the file is only half open because black has a pawn on it this is a closed file this is an open file and a lot of uh, new students get confused and say it's not open because there are pieces on it especially this bishop blocking the rook but that piece can move at any time so this file is considered open pawns can't just jump out of the way. Uh, you, normally you have to make a trade, so that's why they will say this file is completely open even though right now there's a white bishop uh, temporarily blocking it. You can see this is an open file. The rest of the files are, uh, are, are closed, although here you can technically say this is half open for black. Okay, um, in terms of structure, the pawn structure, um, you may say that blacks is better. Each team has two pawn islands. 
and islands uh, of ponds are defined really by whether or not ponds are connected either on the same line or on adjacent files so here this pawn is connected to this pawn here on f3 because they're on adjacent files at any point this pawn could move and, and protect this pawn here so these four pawns are considered one island and these doubled pawns here are considered uh, considered one island these are really weak pawns uh, because they can't protect each other uh, how many pawn islands does black have they also have two these are connected and so are these three um, at the at this point especially in the end game when you start to um, analyze these positions I highly recommend that you set this position up on your chessboard put the black uh, notation numbers in front of you that's the seven and eight here in front of you set the position up exactly as you see it and then um, you can put your head down listen to the voice uh, uh, my voice on the video um, and then try to pick up the squares when you hear the names without looking at the notation lines so um, one nice trick is as a student take your mouse cursor here I don't know if you can see the buttons uh, I don't think you can with my recording but I'm hovering my mouse uh, cursor right over the pause button so at any point I could pause this video um, and you should do the same at home so take your mouse make sure the the mouse is right over the pause button and then take your hands away and get into a calculating pose if at any point you want to stop the video just click the mouse the video stops and you get to think about something so for example if I say what square is the black king on um, without looking at the board I mean without letters and numbers um, you can do that but if you don't want the video to keep on going you just click pause until you get your answer and then click uh, you know pause again and it should come back on okay so here we go what Fisher did here was uh, really incredible because th these grandmasters are so strong they can actually see as I mentioned in the introduction the winning ending hiding in this position so a trick and and you know Fisher is not the first grandmaster to do this this is a well-known technique one idea in chess is if you're up material so in this case we're up one point we have an exchange rook for for bishop and one extra and um, I'm sorry white has one pawn for that so you're technically up one point what Fisher did here is he saw that he could give back the exchange that's the rook for the bishop win the pawn back so then the material would be completely equal but leave himself with a winning king and pawn ending okay so that's actually hiding in this position so you can pause your video and see if you can find the forcing sequence and when you're ready you can click it back on and let's take a look at what actually happened okay here we go so hopefully you found the move rook takes bishop and this is all forced I mean you have to take this piece back otherwise you're down a whole rook so Lombardi takes Rook takes pawn check, forcing the king to retreat and protect the rook on the back rank. It doesn't matter where he goes. The result's going to be the same. We trade the rooks. And we start marching toward the white pawns. Because what Fisher did by reconnecting these pawns is he created a very weak square here on c4. And there's no way that white can prevent black from occupying that square so he knows the pawns going to be attacked so he starts to centralize the king king c4 permanently blockades the pawn and now at this point white is going to just play some moves and hope that black can't really crash through but what what black will do in response so for example here white played uh, h5 what fisher does is he just starts making pawn moves that don't commit anything yet he's just telling white well you have to move something and every time you move then I'll improve my position and that's exactly where we are now so um, white played king to c2 and now g5 so here white could take on Passant if they wanted to um, but he decided to play h6 
But by doing that, there's one set of pawns that are locked up. All we need to do is get them all locked up, and then we're going to be able to penetrate with this king. So white to play. I'm sorry, black to play. He plays f4. And again, whether you take or push past, the position's going to be locked. And you have to do one or the other. Otherwise, black will just take the pawn and run. So white decides to keep all the pawns on the board. And then a5. And it's amazing how all of this is pretty much forced. There's no way around this. If you don't take the pawn, um, you're, you're going to lose something on this square. If you push past, you're going to lose the pawn. So white just took, took, and there we go. There's the position we had uh, when you first turned on the video. Um, white played um, king to b2, pawn a4 king a3 and then the conclusion of the game king takes pawn okay so what I'd like you to do is go back to this position that was set up and see if you can follow the moves to the game I want you to listen to my voice calling out the moves and I'm only gonna go um, I think I'm gonna give you five moves here and I want you to do your best to visualize the position uh, in your head. So you, you look at the pieces, but don't move them. So in this position, we have rook takes c3 check, pawn takes rook, rook takes pawn on e5 check, king d2, we trade rooks at the top of the board on e1, king takes back king d5 king d2 and then king c4 and when you're done take a look at the board now or the video now and see if that position is what you have in your uh, you were able to see in your head you can rewind this go back to the uh, part of the video where I walked you through these first four or five moves, and you can keep repeating that. It's a great exercise to uh, improve your calculation. All right, hope you guys enjoyed the video. We'll see you in class on Sunday.